And he was like, listen, uh, I gave back to my community and I know how it feels. I know what you're going through right now. And I just wanted to support you this way. People are continuously saying hello and thank you almost every day. It means so much. Like, I wonder if they know how much, you know, but uh, it definitely does uh, something great for me. It makes me feel so good inside. And that's why I enjoy what I do here. Hey, this is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and each other. I'm your host, Amber Castillo. In 1992, Henry Buell was leaving his apartment in Soho when a man experiencing homelessness asked him for 20 bucks. Henry offered the man the 20 in exchange for sweeping the sidewalk in front of his building. Then he rallied the stores in his neighborhood to follow suit, and pretty soon, more New Yorkers were eager to join the sweeping crew. From this small act, the Association of Community Employment Programs was born. Now, A serves more than 650 people each year with workforce development, therapeutic counseling, adult basic education, and job readiness training. They've helped over 3,000 New Yorkers overcome homelessness, incarceration, and addiction. But in 2020, things took a turn. Despite quickly reopening following the COVID-19 shutdown, the team was forced to operate differently. There was a surge in need that they had never seen before. Still today, Elizabeth McNearney, the ACE program's director, says it's harder than it's ever been. Today, we'll hear from Elizabeth about the growth of ACE, what they experienced during the height of the pandemic, and the importance of the community they've built. Later, we'll hear from ACE graduates David Stewart and Harry Garcia about how ACE helped them and what they're up to now. So you've been working at ACE since 2008, right, in a different role, and then you were director of programs in 2012. What has kept you here for, for so long? It's very much like a family vibe. I mean, we have graduates in contact from the 90s who still come in. When I started, I was running our aftercare program, and that is a lifelong aftercare program. So the goal is to help them keep their jobs, increase their earning power, and, uh, you know, transition to long-term independence. But so we have all kinds of different programming. But when they're in the program, they're here four days a week, and then they're coming at nights for different events, and they get to know us. And people are here for so long. We have such established relationships, and that's so powerful because that trust is what helps people kind of come in when things are rocky, you know. And so, you know, we had a... (laughs) A um, one of our graduates, Ace, helped her apparently throw a um, her son a one year birthday party. This is before I was there, and she just called and put me on the phone with him. I mean, I've known him since he was a little boy, and um, he's like twenty one now, and he's like going to college. I was like, oh my god, like <laughs> time. So it's like you know, we see their kids grow up, and um, and I think in social services, it's there's a lot of burnout, and here we have the agility to kind of meet people where they're at because we're a little smaller, you know, um, we know everyone by name, nobody's a number. Um, There's no like slipping through the cracks here, you know? So if somebody needs something to make, help make them successful, if there's been a stumbling block over and over and over in their lives, you know what I mean? We're going to address it, but we're going to coordinate with providers or connect them with providers and make sure that works with their schedule here. And then follow up with those providers and, and reinforce the messaging and, and be communicating. And so, um, most of the people who are here are also engaged in many are engaged in substance use treatment programs. Some are, you know, engaged with like another court. Some are working with, I don't know, different things, different like ther- therapeutic experiences. Some aren't, you know, but um, we do a lot of coordinating with other providers and a lot of wraparound care because we're all about sustainable change um, and making sure that we lay the foundation for someone to actually move forward in their lives. You know, uh, homelessness tends to be cyclical. And there's a reason for that. You know, there's not the safety net there or you just one thing. It's like, you know, if you find that job, that's great. But if you don't have stable child care, what are you going to do? And have you noticed in recent years, especially during the pandemic, with the rise of substance use disorder and kind of an overdose rates and all of that, and also the rise in homelessness, have there been any changes to how ACE operates? So we came back. Uh, in 2020. I know like a lot of places are still operating remotely, but we're like, we can't do this work remote. We need to see people. They need somewhere to go. 
so we were remote for a little while, but then we we're like, we have to be here because people were in crisis. Like we had never seen before. I mean, I've been here for over 15 years and I've ne- in the, the 12 or whatever that preceded the pandemic, I have never seen like crisis and need. Like I have seen in the last three years, we've lost, we've lost graduates to overdose things like, like mental health things are coming up that we hadn't seen before. I've taken countless people, like I feel like to the, to Bellevue ER and like sat with them. So they were comfortable so that they could access psych services. It's been brutal. The isolation is brutal. So that's when we came back in, yeah, I want to say October, 2020. So we pivoted, the whole staff pivoted to just outreaching our graduates. Anyone who would come through the program like ever we applied for all these grants we distributed cash we you know got people groceries if they lost income we tried to do what they could replace them we were doing job search services just to like help do damage control for everyone you know for our graduate community and then we and we had some graduates that were like no i'm okay give it to someone else and how can i help and like everyone really came together and we were also like helping distribute meals and stuff and, um, and our sanitation workers actually came back after five weeks because they're like essential workers. So they were doing cleanup services, you know, cleaning bus stops and trying to keep things safe. But um, that's when we started doing more like support groups, um, started writing all these grants. Like I need an army of social workers. That's what I need. But it's been like, I've never seen anything like it is now like it's and you call like counseling places and there's waiting lists and waiting lists some places won't even like give you a date they're like oh call back in six months like there's not enough therapists and psychiatrists and walk-in services in the city has some of that funding dried up is it harder now that the public emergency is over even if it's the pandemic's not over i would say we've been fortunate in in that regard because that was never a that was just something we did as a one-time thing and that was all the money was just passed through to our graduates um, we just handed out cash, metric cards, groceries, but a lot of our funding comes from the, the support and employment program that we do is like, I think it's like over half the city council. I can get you the exact number, but, you know, provides discretionary funds for us to do sanitation services in their district. And then many of them also provide funds for us to do outreach to the community and other services. And so that's a big funder. So we're very grateful to them. And I think, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, people were freaking out about hygiene. So naturally, sanitation services did not fall by the wayside, whereas a lot of other things did. Um, So we've been fortunate. I think the challenge is not that the funding dried up. The challenge is just that the, the need increased so dramatically. Like even now, it's like I get like I get calls on my cell phone with people like in crisis on the weekend and everyone is like double and triple down to like responding. We we start doing like flex hours, more weekend hours, like connecting people to services. And we are a vocational agency, but with the demographic we serve, people who have experienced you know, addiction, homelessness, incarceration, there is so much working against them and it it, it is harder than it's ever been. So since you started at ACE, what were some of the biggest challenges you had seen in, in operating? Or if you just can talk about some of the changes that you've, that you've witnessed and that you've been a part of. When I started at ACE, I think we had like maybe four classes a week. We were sweeping um, down in Soho. From there, I mean, since then, we introduced an adult education program. We introduced industry-specific skills training initiatives. We we formalized um, our counseling services, um, added so many layers of therapeutic support, brought in lawyers, financial coaches, uh, substance use coaches, um, restructured our classes, um, did a lot more like peer counseling with like um, supervisors. Our work experience component has expanded. We're in all five boroughs. Um, We work with like half the city council, whereas that was a new initiative, I think started around like 2012. Um, We got our first bid and that was kind of our intro to like doing sanitation services for funding type world. We were just doing it before because it was like a work experience opportunity. Nobody minds if you sweep their block. You know what I mean? So like, I feel like we've, we've just, we've transformed. How did that happen? I think it's just piece by piece. We always like make sure we're agile enough to meet the need. And I think the amazing part of that is we have not lost who we are, that like family feel, you know, no matter how we grow, it stays intimate and hopefully safe you know, um, for people in a place that 
our graduates want to be involved in and stay connected to. And there's no magical lesson plan that's going to change anything for everyone. But community is the one thing that I think you can rely on and everyone can come back to. Like, I know, I don't know what the answer is yet, but I know if I go there, I'm going to get support and they can help me and we'll figure it out together. You know, and I think that that's what we are and what we do. Next, ACE graduate David Stewart shares how ACE helped him turn his life around. Hello, everyone. My name is David Stewart. I am 59 years young and I love baseball. But I, as a hobby, sort of professional, I am a songwriter. I'm also a single dad of my seven-year-old twins. And so responsibility, and I'm a full-time uh, employee at August Community. So I'm all over the place. I'm a really, really busy guy, a very busy guy. But I do it all for the clients. The clients are my ace number one reason why. So. Being in the trenches of addiction myself and finding a way out with God's help. The promise that I made God that I know that I've said this a thousand times before, but if you're not too busy, can you help me one more time? And two things I'll do in return. One, I'll serve you. And two, I'll reach back and get as many people out of the muck and mire and the trenches as I can and that has been true to date. What are some of the most common uh, kind of questions or situations that you need to help people navigate in this program? So the uh, housing is always like the hey number one, can you help with housing? New York City has a housing issue, has housing problems and that you don't have to be on any type of, <laughs> uh, uh, in any program, any type of uh, substance abuse. Uh, disorder issues, mental health, to have problems with housing, right? I don't particularly do housing, but I have some full sources that I use yeah. and can send to clients. And, and of course, they are the other ones that have to follow through and do the work. How did ACE impact you? So I was, uh, I'm a product of ACE. And when I was in my active addiction, I was in a program and ACE was in this I don't. I won't say infant stages, but it was a, it was newer than what it is now. At the time, I wasn't ready to stop using. It. Coming full circle, how ACE impacts me now is, wow. After I was just, uh, lack of a better term, abdicated from the facility of back then, I am now part of the team and part of the solution, and that blows my mind. Like David. Harry Garcia credits Ace and his peer cohort for much of his success. So uh, I was able to quickly connect with them and take advantage of the opportunity. And it was one of the best things that I've done in my life because immediately after, you know, just coming here the first day, I immediately felt a feeling like I was going to su su succeed. I, and I was so happy because I've only felt this feeling like three times. So when I had the feeling, I was like, yes, I, I, I felt this before. Uh, this, this is great in this, you know? So that was super exciting. Uh, they have great one-on-one -on -one counseling here. And Paula's my counselor, and she's amazing. Before I came to Paula, I was like, I was ready to fulfill my purpose. I was ready for that. I was ready to find a place that I could call a home. And Paula listened to me very closely, very intently. She listened to me. And one day she came up to me and she was like, I have this class for you, this training. I want you to go. And it was a recovery coach training, what we were talking about when we were on a one-on-one -on -one session. And it was like, it just clicked. I went, I had a great time. ACE at the same time, like offers you two days out of the week to have work experience and kind of like build your confidence back again. I completely enjoy doing it. My time goes so fast, I don't even realize. It feels like five minutes. That's how much fun I'm having. Why are you, why are you having so much fun? I have no idea. I wish I knew. I was just sweeping the streets. I, I, believe me, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. What do you remember from that? Like, who or what are part of your first memories? So, some of my first memories were just with the, my co-workers. 
they made me feel like a family. And it was really easy to just come in and do what I had to do. Is there a memorable experience you have from when you were first starting at Ace or when you were first starting, like, working outside? Yeah, yeah. One of the most memorable experiences, and it, and it happens continuously. It's not an experience that just happened once. Uh, people pass by and person passed by and he told me, uh, are you thirsty? And I was like, no, it's okay. He goes, no, please let me help you out. And uh, I was like, okay. He goes, I'm going to get you a bottle of water. I was like, no, just give me a Coke. Give me a can of Coke. He came back with a bottle of water and a can of Coke. And he was like, listen, uh, I gave back to my community and I know how it feels. I know what you're going through right now. And I just wanted to support you this way. And people are continuously saying hello and thank you almost every day. Hello, thank you. It means so much. Like, I wonder if they know how much, you know? But uh, it definitely does uh, something great for me. It yeah. makes me feel so good inside. And that's why I enjoy what I do here. When did you first start um, kind of seeing or feeling a change in yourself uh, while you've been at ACE? I started feeling a change like three weeks into ACE. And like I said before, I was doing one-on-one counseling with Paula, and I started to believe myself again. And my life began to transform. If you want to learn more or get involved with ACE, you can find them at acenewyork.org. Also, tomorrow, December 14th, is the last day that you can support their annual toy drive on Amazon. Every year, their toy drive brings joy to hardworking New Yorkers and their families served at ACE. You can participate by clicking the link in our show notes. Our original story on ACE is part of a series of articles exploring health inequities in New York, funded by a grant from the Commonwealth Fund. That's all for today. Thanks for listening and thanks for supporting us as we do our best to support our community. We couldn't do it without you. For more stories like this, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at epicenter-nyc.com. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Caravica. You can find more of their music on their website linked in our podcast description.